Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where your streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place, though I walk through the Blessed be your name Every blessing you pour out I'll turn back to praise When the darkness closes in Lord, still I will say Blessed be the name Blessed be your name when the sun's shining down on me When the world's all as it should be Blessed be your name Blessed be your name on the road marked with suffering Though there's pain Blessed be your name Every blessing you pour out I'll turn back to praise When the darkness closes in Today's reading is from Acts 2 verses 14 to 26. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd, fellow Jews and all who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. 
Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken to the prophet Joel. In the last days of God, I will pause. Sorry, in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all the people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above all the signs of the earth, blood and fire and bellows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness, the moon turned to blood, before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man of God, accredited by God to you to do miracles, wonders and signs, which God did among you through him as you know yourselves. This man was handed over to you by the God's deliberated plan and foreknowledge and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep hold on him. David said about him, I saw the Lord always before me, because he, has, because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body will also rest in hope. This passage that we've just read from Acts chapter 2, it's Peter's very first sermon that he preached. If you remember, like we've read earlier in the previous Sundays, just before Jesus ascended into heaven, he reminded the 120 followers in Jerusalem that he promised the coming of the Holy Spirit. And last week we saw that 10 days later, the Holy Spirit was in fact poured out in power upon these gathered. The Holy Spirit manifested itself and himself upon these people. The explosion of that power with which the Spirit brought came upon them so loud that it attracted thousands thousands of Jewish pilgrims in the city. And what happened is they all were speaking in different languages, in languages that were either recognised by people around them. Peter's very first sermon. You say, why did he have to give that? What was that all about? The question that I normally ask is, why did he say what he said? He was addressing the crowd, but why did he say this? What does this mean? That was the question that a lot of people were asking. What does this mean? What does this mean for you? What does it mean for me? This coming of the Spirit upon us. What does this mean? And Peter knew what was going on. And he responded to that. And he answered that question. What does this mean? A lot of us have been asking that question. What does this mean that we're going through this hard time? What does this mean for us? What does this mean for our church? What does it mean for our country? What does this mean for our world? What does this mean? Pentecost is the birthday of the church. And I don't want to miss that important fact. But the first act, the first ministry of the church was a sermon that Peter preached. Biblical proclamation is the primary means that God wants us to be advancing towards his kingdom. What's so important about this guy?
If you read the Gospels, you will see that Peter was first among the apostles. He was first in everything. First to walk out on water. First to open his mouth. First with his sword. Second to the tomb only, because he couldn't run fast as the others could. He basically said to Jesus, Look, Lord, I don't know. I don't know about the rest of these boys, but you are looking at a man. So all of them all love you. I will never forsake you. I will never leave you. But on the very first evening, he denied. He denied the Lord before a servant girl. Now it's amazing, I don't know about you, but I found this really amazing. 50 days later, he's this apo you know, apologist, uh, spokesperson, giving the inaugural sermon of the Christian church on the day of Pentecost. Something magnificent happened to Peter. Something amazing happened to Peter. And that was the filling of the Holy Spirit in his life. Is that the case in your life? How do you allow God to speak to you? How do you allow the Spirit to lead you and guide you? This coming of the Holy Spirit on that Pentecost Sunday are so important. It tells us the nature of God, of what he wants us, how he wants us, how much he loves us. But he also shows us the power of God and his spirit. I want us to remember that he hadn't pre prepared the sermon he hadn't prepared his remarks that are written here. He didn't have notes in front of him. This was simply an overflow of the truth of God's word. Because God's word was saturated in his life. I want to say that what happened was Jesus had prepared Peter. And set it in his heart. Peter was saturated in God's word because Jesus had poured out onto him. Peter's sermon was biblically rooted, was scripturally rooted. It was not just a speech. It was centred on Jesus It was centered around this guy who was with them, who showed them the way to God. He was the focal character. Peter didn't make himself that focal character, not the disciples. How are we allowing the Spirit to move us? As a church, do we allow that to happen? As individual people, do we allow the Spirit to move in our lives? If not, why? Here we read in this chapter 2, and it says, it's a prophet, prophet Joel has said in the Old Testament, in the last days, God will pour out I will pour out my spirit on all people. Not just one or two, on all people. 
So God wants to pour out His Spirit on you, my friends. Are, are you prepared? Are you ready for it? If not, why? Why not? Are we just stuck in our own ways of thinking that we don't want anything to do with where God might be leading us or challenging us on? Why? But when that spirit comes in our life, when that spirit fills us up, what happens? We read, your sons and daughters will prophesy, your young men will see visions, your old men will dream dreams. Even in my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit and they will prophesy. I will show the wonders in the heaven above and signs on the earth below. Are we seeing those signs here? Are we filled in the Spirit so much so that we allow God to take control of our lives and to lead us in ways that He wants us to lead us? Friends, Jesus died on the cross for you and for me. Don't let His death go in vain. <coughs> he died on the cross for a reason. And the reason was redemption from sin. Us being freed from that, from that, from the shangles, from that bondage that's around us. Him leaving his spirit for us and with us and amongst us is a sign that God loves us. He wants the best for us. So are we prepared? That's my question for us. Are we ready? This is weird sometimes, you know, sitting in two different rooms. But this is the best that we can do for now. Are we going to thank God for it? For even allowing us to do this? Or are we just going to complain? How is God moving in your life? How is the Spirit moving in your life? Last week when we were here and all those on Zoom as well, while I played a song, I asked you to go back to the time when you first gave your life to Christ and remember that day. How many of you were able to do that? Or how many found that very blurry? The Spirit wants us to remember those important things in our lives that have changed us. And if we can't remember it, it's not too late. We can renew it. We can ask for the Spirit to come again. Jesus loves us. He's loved us so much that he gave himself on that cross for you and for me. Because he's got a plan for our lives. And his plan was so that we don't live in sin. But we, want to, we should be breaking free from sin. Knowing that we are saved. We are forgiven. So friends, how much are you filled? Do you know? Are you on the brim? Are you really at the bottom? Or are you overflowing? And when you overflow with the Spirit, that is evident in you. Evident not only through your life, but through others around you as well. So as we go into this next phrase of looking at a few business things and a few things that have gone on, Let's prepare our hearts before God. Let's ask for the Holy Spirit to come into our lives and prepare us for the next bit. If there have been times when God's been absent in our lives, 
God wants to be present. Are we letting him in? Or are we leaving him outside the door? My prayer is that he's in our lives. And my hope is he is. But that's something for you to think and ponder upon. And pray upon. And fast upon. Jesus died as an offering for guilt. He died, just like John said in his first epistle, as an atoning sacrifice for sin. His death was so that we didn't have to die for that. But his victorious resurrection gives us that hope. Jesus didn't remain dead. He rose from the dead. He is alive. Do you believe that? He is alive. That should bring us smiles behind our masks. That should bring us joy in our heart. That should make us happy because he's alive. He's with us. He has defeated death. His grave is empty. When Peter preached his first sermon, he was addressing the crowd because they were making false accusations. They were not seeing the power of that spirit. They were saying that people were drunk. Peter were addressing the needs of that crowd. Now as we go ahead, and as we talk in our AGM in a few minutes, before we do that, I want us to prepare our hearts. Just for a minute, still our hearts. And then I'm going to pray for us. And invite the Holy Spirit to come into your lives and fill you up. Let's just bow our heads and just close our eyes and just focus on what we've heard today. Remember what we've heard. And still our hearts before Christ. Lord Jesus, thank you for your death on that cross that sets us free, gives us new hope and life. Lord Jesus, I pray that may your spirit be amongst us. Fill us afresh with your Holy Spirit. And Lord, I pray that may your will be done in our lives through your Spirit. 
to lead us and guide us into the place where you want us to go. Help us to have open hearts, hearts that will be prepared to be moved and challenged by your Spirit. Hearts that will be prepared to move and sometimes feel uncomfortable but knowing that this is from you and for us. Lord, your death on the cross, your death for our sins gives us new hope. Father, as, as we talk, as we share in the next few moments, and as we listen, Lord, may your spirit guide us. Anything that's not from you, Lord, we just bind down your name. Lord, we pray that your will be done in our church, in our lives, in our neighbourhood, in our country, in our world. Prepare us, Lord. Amen. Amen.